Today the 2020 Rome Diamond League was supposed to take place in Naples, but unlikely that's not going to happen, as you know. But I would be really glad to compete there with the top athletes around the world for the, uh, for the victory in Rome, because in my stadium you can imagine how huge is it but this year is not going to happen so i'm just here to tell you to take a brief sit down because it's not going to happen a live competition but we put together some highlights of the last diamond league room for you so take a brief sit down and enjoy this amazing video i hope to see you soon guys thank you gimbo and yes welcome to the wonder diamond league call room Coming up on this Rome special, we'll have highlights from the Italian capital, as well as interviews with some of the stars that have made the meeting so special in recent years. That includes Malaika Mahambo, Helen Beery, and Donovan Brazier. Before all that, let's kick off with some highlights, starting with a very special run in 2016 from Wade Van Niekerk. There is Wade Van Niekerk, the couple of silver medalist two years ago, but boy, how he came on last year. It is his first outdoor race of the Northern Hemisphere summer. He has raced very well already in uh, South Africa, 44-11, back in uh, early May. There's his at Makwala. So Galvan in one, McDonald in two, Borley in three, Van Niekerk in four. This will be fascinating from the South African in lane four, the world champion. Makwala five, watch him. Haroon six, Taplin, Norwood, and Lendorm to complete the lineup. Well, he's at Makwala there to ride a picture in lane five. Runs with that yellow armband on his right arm, and he's gone off yet again very quickly indeed, gaining ground on Haroon outside him. The youngster Haroon, the youngest in the field, running strongly. There he is, fourth from left in the black. In the green is uh, Taplin for Grenada in lane seven. But certainly. Van Nieke has gone off quickly too and he's up with Makwala. Van Nieke in the grey in lane four, eases round the bend, the reigning world champion. Looks like he's heading for a good one. Makwala trying to come back at him, good running from Taplin too, Taplin coming back to Van Nieke. Those flailing arms of Van Nieke, keep him clear by Vita, comes towards the line, watch the clock, it's a strong run, 44-2-0. And that very, very close to the uh, fastest time in the world this year. He has himself has run 44-11. It will probably be rounded down. It has indeed 44-19. But that was a fabulous run, beautifully judged. What lanes four, five, six? Asher Smith, Talu, Thompson. Good start there from Asher Smith, also going well is Talu, Asher Smith pulling away now, he's got half a metre, Thompson coming back at her now though, Thompson's going to take her this time, and that is a surprise, about half a metre in it, 10.89 there, Dina Asher Smith looking, Smith looking lovely and um, relaxed there, but she beat Elaine Thompson last week by about 4 metres over 200 metres in a freezing cold Stockholm, and tonight Maybe a little bit of ire, a little bit of anger and fire in the belly of the Jamaican Olympic champion, Lane Thompson. So Baker in four, watch him in fine form. Biko in five, Rogers six, Britain's Uja in seven. Well, really good start in three for Maite, but now Baker begins to get into his running in the blue, dragging Maite with him. Maite battling alongside him there, coming through Vico in the yellow, and on the near side, Uja has a brilliant run! Uja takes it! 10-0-3 against a good, good field. Lyles gets a pretty good start, Norman an even better one and Norman's already taken a yard out of Lyles around that top end, the two of them go sailing past the world champion, Tortu going well in the yellow of Italy, it's Norman with a half a metre over Lyles, he continues to go away but Lyles surely will come back and here he comes and has he got time to get there, it's Norman versus Lyles and Lyles, oh it's close, I'm not going to call it, maybe Norman with a last little lead, just hanging on, it looked like Lyles had the momentum and then just in the last half a stride, Norman 
shoved that chest of his forward. Yeah, at this point you think Lyles is going to come past and then just that last stride, half of his chest gets pushed forward by Norman, gets the 200th of a second win, a personal best of course. It is a world lead and a meeting record to boot. Christian Coleman in lane five. The world indoor champion and world record holder had to suffer defeat to his teammate Ronnie Baker in Eugene the other day. Baker does run well in Eugene, doesn't always travel well to Europe though. Ronnie Baker was third here in Rome last year, took the bronze medal behind Coleman at those world indoor championships, but is super quick as well. And that time with the win behind them was a 984 in Eugene. It'll be a huge cheer for Filippo Tortu. European Junior Champion last year, silver medal at the World Junior Championships the year before that, 19 years of age. Baker gets it to go to start as Coleman, the two of them are right by side each other, Coleman just got the lead, Baker's usually stronger towards the end, it's going to be Baker again, Baker coming away, gets it by a yard this time, Baker wins it, and then over in three may well have been there, young Ovico getting second place, it almost looked to me as though Coleman gave it up, now look at the clock as well, 9.93, the wind just a tad in their face and Baker executed that perfectly well I heard him talk about what happened in Eugene he said when I get out alongside Coleman because Coleman's normally such a good starter I know that I can go past him Santos in one, Didou two, Roberts in three, Haroon look out for him, the tall Qatari in four, Fred Curley in five Cherry in six, Hudson Smith, Great Britain in seven, Saint Ray, Kendrick's the Italian in eight, Lucios from Spain in lane nine. Hey. Yeah, a slightly Sanzo longer hold than the Devo, athletes Robert, would have required, but away they go. Smith, uh, Michael Cherry has made a good start. Haroon at the moment is being eaten into by Neil Roberts. Roberts has made a good start, as has uh, Michael Cherry. Michael Cherry. With Matt Hudson Smith ahead of him. He's going well down the back straight as they come off the bend. And now Haroon starting to go. But well, two to go. And there is Curley. Fred Curley. He's done very well indeed with a slightly ungainly start. Has he got enough to, to come through here? Also going well today on the inside. But Curley. Now back comes Haroon. Really stretching. He's left it late here. Haroon coming back strongly. Has he done enough? Not quite. What an unbelievable race from Haroon. But Curley. All credit to him, the big Texan. He got his nose in front. He ran aggressively for the first 300. And then just backed himself to stay there. will be the one to beat, I'm sure. But, it's a big but, Donovan Brazier, Clayton Murphy, others hoping they've got a chance. The men's 800 metres with a very fast first lap in store. McBride will be another one, he'll be the tall Canadian, will be hoping that he can get in amongst it here. It's kind of like, almost like a World Championship Olympic, almost semi-final this. It's a very good quality field, Amos just cutting across behind the pacemaker Abda through the first 200 meters he's done pretty well kept it uh, around the 25 seconds maybe just under 25 seconds they must in a good spot I should be interested Steve here to see how Donovan Brazier goes the best of the Americans at the moment third in Doha and a season's best and then uh, that was a 144.70. He's well positioned at the moment in fourth place in that all back strip. He's a big fella too, Brazier. Has this ability to look very, very relaxed at good speed. And that's just about perfect. 49.9. Excellent pace making, and that's why they're all stacked up behind him there, Root. You've got Amos, is in a great spot. And look at Brazier just hanging around there. Clayton Murphy following McBride behind him as well. Young Abdallah not too far away. So we've got a great. Last 200 metres in prospect here. Really is looking as though Amos is uh, going to come under a little bit of pressure here. 
already Kenya Mal just going past him. Look at him, how strong he looks. But has he gone a little bit early because Brazier is still hanging on and Amos is not beaten. So Kenya Mal in the front, but he's maybe just gone a little bit too early. Has he timed it right? Because Amos is attacking again round the outside. McBride trying to get back in there. And it looks like Rotich finishing very quickly, but it's Amos now with the strength. Brazier trying to get back to him. It's going to be tight. Who's going to get it? It's close. Maybe Amos just getting it. 143-63. A great surge in the end from Brazier. What a race that was, and we'll have more highlights from Rome later in the show. Before that, let's talk to the winner of that wonderful 800 from 2019, Donovan Brazier. Going from NCAA venues and college and high school facilities to an Olympic stadium must be quite the change. I mean, right off the bat, it was just different. I mean, traveling, you know, I think it was like a 12-hour flight or so, you know, because we're all the way in America. Um, it was just hard on my legs, and I think what I learned is that you know, feeling good is overrated, you know, because when you travel for 12 hours and when you're kind of out of your time zone and stuff like that, no one's ever going to feel good. So my coach is kind of telling me that you're not going to feel good, but you're going to run fast because of, like you said, being in an Olympic stadium and just kind of the atmosphere that was bringing there. Do you think as well with it being your first international meet, um, how well do you think you managed your adrenaline on that occasion? Because 800 is so much about patience as much as it is about mm. performance. I think I managed it uh, decently well. I think, uh, you know, when I ran the first time there, it wasn't the fastest meeting that they've had there, and it wasn't the second time either. But I think I managed it pretty well. I think I was just kind of trying to live in the moment and enjoy everything, you know, because going everywhere from, like, the warm-up track and you kind of take that tunnel system out to, like, the big track, I think I was just really trying to live in the moment, and I think that kind of helped me, like, calm down and settle my nerves. Yeah, man, that must have been crazy going to the Rome warm-up track. Did you, did you think, oh, Europe's just all like this? I thought that the warm-up track was our, like, racing track because it was so beautiful. You know, they had, like, all those statues around the whole, like, um, bend of the turns and the straightaways of the track. And then when you look back on 2017, uh, how do you reflect on it now? Because you made your first uh, U.S. team, I think, by the end of it, a few mm -hmm. international races and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, I think 2017 was just a big learning curve for me. You know, it was my first year at pro. It was my first year um, running overseas and, you know, running well overseas and making a team. And I think, you know, I didn't – compete necessarily well but I definitely learned uh, a lot from that 2017 season and then we have to fast forward to 2019 because besides a few indoor races in 2018 you were you were basically injured weren't you I think yeah. you mentioned to me last last year you, you spent the whole time fishing and cooking yeah that's, that's exactly what I did so the 2018 season it ended after um Birmingham Indoor Worlds in, in 2018 and I didn't race a single outdoor meet all of 2018 and then I raced my first uh outdoor race I think it was a total of like a 10 month gap and I opened up in, in Doha in 2019, but no, it was a really good time for me to reflect on like kind of like my training system that I had and my coaching and my environment. And that's kind of when I made the move out to, to Oregon and it uh, seems to be working pretty well so far. Yeah, man. It's it, almost like 2019, you came back a, a new, more determined athlete. I think third place in Doha in, in your first meet outdoors. Do you, yeah. Did you feel like you were in the shape? Cause I, hadn't you, like smashed the world 600 meter record or something at the start of last yeah, year. Yeah, and, and that's you feel you know, like meaningless, you know, in the whole grand scheme of things, the 600 meter world best. Um, but it went back to, like you said, in 2017, Rome. Like it was just, uh, um, it was just kind of, it was recognizing that I'm not going to feel good. So you're right. When I did show up to Doha, I didn't think that I was going to be too competitive. I always try to aim for those top three spots. And um, I came third and that was feeling like complete, you know, heading over to, to Qatar. But, um, I think that race was a real confidence booster for me because it showed like, yeah, it's like a 10 month gap of racing outdoors. And yeah, I felt like the entire, you know, whole trip. And, you know, at the end of the day, I was still able to compete pretty competitively given the, the race kind of tactics I took during it. Did you feel like you were in shape to win after that? Yeah, definitely. I think my confidence was, was pretty high, but it wasn't quite there to kind of be aggressive enough to make the, you know, the moves that, um, that could beat a uh, Emmanuel career and Nigel Amos. But, 
I definitely feel like I got clipped up with about 150 meters to go. And, you know, that's just racing. You know, I can't say what if or, you know, if I didn't get clipped, I would have won because, you know, you could speculate all day. But I definitely feel like I was in shape to, to win that race. And then a couple of weeks later in Rome, really hot, kind of very mm. elite lineup. Nigel's there. And another really hot race. That, mm. that one was, I mean, it was kind of a, a first time that we see your new sit back tactics really pay off just yeah. tell me about that race and and kind of your approach to it yeah so we're back in rome 2019 two years you know before my um opener to the diamond league and i was just uh i was trying to do better than i did in doha and that wasn't even necessarily place wise it was a combination of time wise and just racing tactic wise and the time wise i think i executed that um doing that better than doha but racing tactics wise i would say i still put myself in a bit of a rough but yeah, no, Rome was just all about kind of sitting back and letting another guy do the work instead of opposed to the way I usually run and kind of letting myself go right off the pacer. And, um, you know, with 100 meters left, I was sitting in third place. And, you know, I'm, I'm never just happy to be there, even though I wasn't third. And that's kind of the position I kind of root for. But um, with 100 meters left, I was in third position and kind of got boxed in with 50 left. Nigel and I both kind of had a couple of rough things happen to us that last 80 meters. And, um, you know, like you said, it was kind of like that sit and surge that, that I think I just trusted all the training I put in 2019 and knowing that I'm the type of athlete that can finish 100 meters, you know, you know, as good, if not better than anybody else that can run the eight. Before you make that move, is there ever like a part in your brain which just thinks this is going to hurt so much? I, de I, I think that I, I'm thinking form at that point, I think, you know, because I think everybody's form for that 800 starts to like fall apart with 600 meters. Everybody can run, you know, a, a 24 second or a 23 second, 22 second, 200 meters, but it's about, how smooth you can do it in doing so. And, you know, when it comes to that last 50, I, I work on that in practice and getting that lactic in my legs and trying to, you know, change gears and uh, into kind of kicking that last 80 meters. And, you know, I, I definitely think that that race was kind of like the stepping stone for me starting to trust my kick more so than I have in the past. I wanted to ask as well about that moment on the line when you're waiting for the results. Um, in, the, in the instance of Rome, did you know you'd won uh, when you crossed the line? And in general, what is that like? 30 second weight like it must be agonized it was um so I def I didn't think I won I definitely didn't think I won um I thought I came in second and again like I said I was like okay sweet better than Doha place wise and time wise um so I was like cool I, you know I came out happy um I definitely won. I was well, I was definitely hoping to see my name come up first but I was going over to Nigel and I was congratulating him I was like hey man congrats on the win like you got me again because this man's been just whooping my ass for like three years now um but to finally see that, um, you know, I beat him by two one hundredths of a second. Uh, you know, I, I still waited for the results to be confirmed because it was unofficial still. But um, to see that I finally got him and to see that, you know, he is beatable and I, I am the type of athlete that can, you know, go, go head to head with him, I think kind of gave me a lot of confidence going into it. And that was by far the closest race I've ever ran. And, you know, for it to be a diamond league and for it to be the one that I opened up with two years ago, it was, it was a perfect setting. I think the biggest thing for me in 2019 was just, you know, I finally, it was more of a relief season for me because I knew I had the potential to win a world title. I knew I had the potential to make finals and to win medals and to finally earn one. I hate to say it, it was kind of more of a relief to me rather than, a, you know, a pure joy or happiness for me. But, you know, to, fi to, to win one and to, to get that monkey off my back, I think, was uh, a, big, a big thing for me. That's really cool. Yeah. But are you frustrated now? What's happening in 2020? I am a little frustrated because... Uh, we, we had a lot of Americans, Bryce, myself, and uh, Clay included, coming off a good season in 2019. And even indoors, we showed, you know, good, good strength and, and um, that we were doing well. And I think what happens a lot of times when people do good is that they kind of let off the gas. And, you know, they kind of get kind of picky and choosy about where they're racing and how they're racing. And they just don't really perform to where they have in the past. And I just really wanted to prove to myself that this 2020 or 2019 Worlds wasn't a fluke. And that, you know, I am this great racer and I am a medal contender every year and I should be up there with the best. And every race that I run in, you know, I should, you know, have a big target on my back. And for the indoor season, I believed I showcased that pretty well with the 600 meter and 800 meter. So I was really confident, again, leading into this 2020 season and hopefully the Olympics and, and, um, and just, you know, showcasing my talent and, you know, being, I guess, more confident in this season. I'm happy to put it on ice only because of the... Um, you know, the coronavirus situation, you know, if it's going to spread and it's going to, you know, cause more lives and, and just, you know, I think 2021, if they can get control of this coronavirus, it'll be just as special. 
Thank you to Donovan, always a pleasure, and what a 2019 he enjoyed. Later, we'll have chats with Helena Beery and Malaika Mahambo, but before that, let's crack on with the highlights, starting with some distance greats. And Emma Coburn, well, it's her first steeplechase of 2018. It's her first outdoor race of any sort this year, so perhaps a slight question mark over how good she is, but uh, we'll find out in the next nine minutes or so. So here they are at the bell. Emma Coburn, the world champion, leading the way with chest bolt and Keang and Geruto in, in danger of being dropped. And this is when technique matters so much. You know, if you can take and attack these barriers on the last lap when you're trying to lift your pace and you've got much more chance, and Coburn is going to be really tested here. Chepsol taking that one nicely. Heang looks strong, doesn't she? So Coburn's trying to work with them. Well, down the back straight for the last time. And Chespol with Keang just starting to ease forward. Coburn has another go. She's not done yet. Chespol then with that lovely languid style. Longer stride than the other two athletes. The tall, upright figure of Emma Coburn coming round. I think to go slightly wider. Keang though with all her experience, 26 years old now. World champion in Beijing and Coburn's gone. Coburn has fallen. Well, that's so, so disappointing. And it's down to two and Chespol has a clear run here as long as she takes no this more, final barrier, but Keyang isn't done yet. Keyang both stuttering into the final barrier and it's at lights out now. The hand breaks off, who's got the biggest sprint? And it's Keyang who's gonna come through. Keyang, the former world champion, gets it on the line. 904.96. Big field, 18 starters in this women's 1500 meters. The meeting record 356 by Abeba Adagawi is uh, probably safe, frankly. They're due to go out in 63 and then 207, which is just under four minute tempo. Fastest time in the world this year by the Olympic champion, uh, Faith Kipiegon, 359. That was in Shanghai. The bell now. It's Hassan leading, 255 at the bell. This is going to be quick. Kloster Halvin in second place, following us stride for stride. Sado in third, Segai in fourth. There's a gap back to fifth place. But Hassan here running the perfect race to drag Kloster Halvin, the German, to a quick time. She's hanging on to her, she'll struggle to do that in terms of uh, Hassan's speed. But Kloster Halvin running a massive race here. She could well run under four minutes. That would be a brilliant performance from the German. Look at Hassan, strong, confident, and kicks away now. She's got this one in the bag. It's just a question of how fast. Costa Halvin in second place has lost a lot of ground over that last 200 metres. She needs to concentrate here, really focus, keep those knees coming through, pump hard with the arms. Hassan does it anyway. She's got that rather awkward round-shouldered style as it's Sifan, Sifan Hassan. But what a run from her. The gap is 15 metres now. Watch the clock. This is going to be quick. Back in second place, Kloster Halvin is hanging on. They're all struggling in her wake. But Sifan Hassan is in a class of her own. Watch the time. This is quick. 3.56.24. My word. And in second place coming through was Winnie Chabet. I said she was one to watch. Goodness me. Second in the world, Gina 800. A few years back, Winnie Chabet. But she was a distant second, despite the quality of her run, because the real quality came from the Dutch woman, Sifan Hassan. So the world champion at this distance, Ayana, has been setting the world delight. She's already racing more than she did last year, really showing her intention to go and post a time. How quick can she go tonight? So Ayana will be asking Tverdestup to lead early on. Also Beatrice Cepkowicz of Kenya. These two will be trying to take her through in a really quick pace. Inside 250 she wants, and that's the way she likes to run. She likes to really set it up. She's not like Tirunesh de Barba, who when she broke the world record, really finished quickly over the last couple of laps. That was in Oslo. And we used to see uh, Defar and de Barba when they ex were exchanging quick times at 5,000 meters, attack the race in a very different way. Ayana's not frightened of going out hard, but what it means is I can't see her having anyone anywhere near us. If, if those pacemakers do a job, up to 3,000 meters. They will probably just let her go, and she's going to be front running all by herself. To Alma Zayana used to run the steeplechase, said she found that a little bit difficult, was frightened of the barriers. Well, she's attacking 
a great barrier here. She's attacking the world record. She's now coached by her husband, Soressa Fida, the last two, three years, and what a job the two of them have done. As she comes into the home straight now, is this is the penultimate time for her. Next time round, she'll be looking at the clock. She's already trying to check what does she have to do. She needs about a 65 last lap. She's got to find something. She's slowed right down here over the last two laps, not significantly, but enough that she has to find something. Has got to raise a sprint, has got to raise a bit of extra pace here. This is the bit she's found difficult in the past. She's strong, she can maintain a good pace, but can she lift it? There's only Meseret Defar and Tiranesh de Barber, two of her compatriots who've ever gone quicker at this distance. Defar, 14-12. Back in 2000, and, uh, sorry, 2008, when she just missed the world record, which had been set by De Barber just a month earlier in Oslo. 14.11.15 to remind you. And here she comes. The crowd are on their feet. They're trying to cheer her home. She's got to find something really quick here. It's going to be close, but I fear it's just starting to slip away. She's got 60 minutes to go. 14.11.15, watch the clock, the time is ticking away, the world record will just elude her, Ayana crosses the line in the second fastest time. Oh my word. Well they do need to uh, hit their marks, when you're operating at that sort of speed, very, very small mistakes in pacemaking and in, in tempo judgment can have a catastrophic effect on the end result. Ayana so close to getting it right in the 5,000 metres tonight, missing the world record if you weren't with us half an hour ago by about a one and a half seconds in the, in the 5,000. So, so close for Ayana, but will she now focus on Rio? And uh, bigger goals perhaps than just the clock. Well, the winner in Doha in 8.05, the winner in Rabat 8.02. A similar increment of improvement would be uh, ideal. Buresh fell there, Tim, as they went into that, he went into that barrier. I'm really not sure what happened to Kipruto out in front on his own. Buresh has picked himself up, but there's only one winner now. 200 to run for Conceslov Kipruto. And he's hammering it, isn't he? Around the crown of the bend, approaches the water jump for the final time, negotiate this well. Don't know why we've cut away from that when the man is heading for possibly under eight minutes. He went through the bell in exactly seven minutes as the battle with Kowal, the European champion, continues uh, further back, 200 metres behind almost. But down the home straight, here is the winner. The winner surely in 30 or 40 metres. And watch the clock. It's going to be so close to eight minutes. It's going to be outside it yet again. He's done this again. time after time after time. 801.43, another massive win. For the lineup. There, a big challenge will come from Helen O'Beary, no doubt. One or two other good athletes, well, there's plenty of good athletes in here. Uh, we're probably going to end up with two races, though, because the pace they've asked for is very, very quick. And uh, the likes of Didai, uh, World Junior Cross Country Champion, tear up in there as well. Well, some um, consternation around the meeting hotel as to what was being asked for pacemaking-wise. Uh, they're going to set off at 67s. Well, that would be under 14 minutes. The idea is to go out hard, and then try and uh, hang on if you like. I'm not sure that's the best way to attack this uh, fast time and I'm not sure it's the best way for Debarba. The problem they've got is to go out as hard as she wants to go out, then you've got to find some good pacemakers. And I'm not convinced they've got two good pacemakers here tonight, Tim. I don't think they've good enough quality. And if you think that they want to go out through 3,000 meters in 8.36, and the young athlete who's been asked to do it has a personal best of nine minutes, you get a, an idea of the kind of task that uh, will face the pacemakers. Well, Helen O'Beary, great athlete that she is, is uh, really stepping up here tonight. The Olympic silver medalist over this distance of 5,000 metres has been in great form over the last two years in particular. Her personal best is 14.22.47. She's got a chance. She's coming down with a good, almost 100 metre lead, certainly good 85 metre lead, as Tim was saying. He's going to take the bell in around 13.13. 13. 
So she needs about a 69 last lap. 68 would get her a personal best. She's going to be close to that. She's now lapping athletes. One or two have dropped out, I think, in that group with the bad pace that they'd set out at. And uh, the youngster, Gidai, is now getting onto the group behind these. But this is Obiri and the crowd rising to her. Well, Obiri here has looked quite supreme. She's destroyed Dibaba. Her uh, veil of invincibility is long gone. She's lapping good athletes here as Helena Biri, Steve. And this is going to be a mighty quick time. It's the manner of the performance that has been special. When you have to inject laps as quick as 65, that's just not the optimum way of holding a pace. She's lapping athletes, which is giving her something to run at, and is lifting this again. There's only four athletes have ever run under 14.20. She's going to be close to it. Helen O'Beary heading for a personal best, heading for one of the quickest ever 5,000 metres, and sprinting away. Helen O'Beary is watching the clock. She's going to win the race, and look at the time, 14.18.38. A huge performance from Helen O'Beary. Still to come, we have field and hurdles highlights from the Italian capital, as well as a chat with Germany's long jump world champion, Malaika Mahambo. Before that, let's catch up with Kenya's Helen O'Beary. You might know her as the two-time Diamond League 5K champion, but as she explains, it all started with the 1500 metres. Did you always think that you wanted to be a longer distance runner? You no, know, I was just thinking that I can do like 1500 metres. So I was just trying, as you can see, I, in 2011, I did 800 meters. So I thought maybe I can go like doing 1500 meters, maybe it will be my longest distance. So then when you raced in the Olympics in 2012, you, I think you ran four minutes in Rome that year. Did you think, okay, this is, this is, this is my distance. I can run a four, a four minute 1500 meters. I can make an Olympic final. This is going to be me. This is going to be my career. Actually, when you run, like you have done your PB in just event, just now you can you know this is my event because I did 359 in Rome 2012. So I thought maybe I should try to run Kenyan trials towards the Olympic in London. So I did like, let me just try, I can do like 14 something, 350 something, 359. So it's like, it's mentally you focus in for doing something. I watched your race from 2017 in Rome, where you set a Kenyan record. Can you remember that one? Ah, yes, I remember. It was maybe, let me say, it was a tough race, because you can say Betty Baba was there. Yeah. And at that time, I had my personal best was from Shanghai, 14 to 22. You know, maybe when you race in a race, you can know just like from Shanghai, 14 to 22. Maybe I said, no, let me just try and see whether Ken Sebe Baba will do a world record. Maybe for me, I can do my personal best or maybe something special for me. But like when Ken Sebe started the race, I said, no, let me fall. But I cannot find myself. You know, when it's a world record race, anybody in that race can win. Maybe it's best with your focus. So I started to follow the Baba from behind. So like three like three kilometers to go, I said, no, can I try and do something? Maybe I can just try like one lap of 65. If the Baba will follow me, maybe I can just relax behind, behind her. So I didn't know it will be like 14, 18, it's a faster time. But I said, maybe if I was ready to go from the word go from maybe two laps to go, I could have done like 14, 12. But I said, no, let me wait my time will come. Yeah, it was a, a memorable race, you know, just doing your personal best national record. So I can say that it was a lot of experience for me. And that year, on 2017, I was in a very, very good shape. So I think it was a race to remember. Yeah, you, you're in excellent shape. I think you'd raced, you'd raced already in, in Shanghai a week before. Is it, is it hard? to come back after running a personal best and then do it again, maybe a week later. Do you, do you, physically, do you feel that fatigue? Do you think you can go faster again over 5,000 meters? Actually, I can do because it's bent with your training. 
and then from there you can talk with my manager Ricky Simpson and my coach so we can decide maybe which track and which time and what I'm going to think about and you can discuss with your coach depending on the best setters you know the best setters is very very a key when you want to break the world record you maybe you want to run faster time you have to have somebody to push you mm. and it will depend what the weather about the location of what you want to do and then also you are training how it's going to be all what are you going to focus next about running maybe that faster race so for me i think i can do faster i think for me when i want to run a faster time it's very important to have pace makers maybe they can just take you like 2600 meters or 3k but for 5000 it's very hard to get somebody who can take you up to 3000 maybe with the three that four base three that base that's a world record base so and you must be focused after the pace makers or what if the pace makers will not reach in like that 2600 you focus that i will do things alone without the pace makers but for me i like to learn in front races so that if the pace makers cannot do their work i will do my work yeah, i will do my work and maybe i can run run very much better yeah big thanks to helen for joining us on the line from her home in kenya Still to come, we'll have a chat with Germany's Malaika Mahambo, but before that, let's crack on with the highlights. First up, a very special run from Abderrahman Samba in 2018. Look out for the dance. So Capello's in five, Clements in six, Varholm in seven, Bet in eight, Samba in lane four. Eight. Men's 400 hurdles. Samba has started pretty quickly. Capello a little bit slower to get going. And Clemens watching Varholm, the world champion, go away. Varholm, who ran a, a world best 300 hurdles indoors, is bound to come to this with some pretty good speed. And he's a great 400 meter runner as well, and showing that to very good effect through this first 200. But it's the Varholm, the world champion, and Samba who are well ahead at the moment. The stagger will start to wind a little bit. Capello starting to get moving a little bit as Samba moves alongside him around the top end. And the Norwegian just checks back a little bit as he changes down there and now he still has a two meter lead but Samba strong in the home straight and look at Varholm stretching for that now he's going to be able to maintain this to the last hurdle Samba with much more momentum goes over in the two of them uh, side by side but now Samba comes away Samba takes the win 47 48 another world lead another improvement he just keeps getting better and better another personal best for the former Mauritanian Naran for Qatar and you have to say that the Norwegian world champion gave him a great race given the fact that it's his first race of the season and as I said at the beginning you throw in those other couple of names this is an event which we could start to see these guys getting into the low 47 seconds who knows even dipping under again they're not that far away Roller then looking to catch a Vetta in this javelin competition. His final opportunity needs 88-15. Oh, and he's hit it. That is fabulous competitive uh, instincts. Boy, oh boy, he knew he needed a bigger effort. So often in the throws, you get the big effort in the first round or the last round. You know it's the last chance saloon. And Thomas Roller has denied his compatriot with 90 meters and six. It's a monstrous effort. Stefanidi now in this uh, pole vault. We've already seen it go well at 4 meters 70. It goes clear the second time of asking at 4.75. First athlete clear. Move now on to the women's triple jump. Yulema Rojas still leading with that 1782. Nobody, including the Bargwin, has been able to challenge the tall Venezuelan. That's another good jump from her. Really consistent, just a little grimace. Perhaps up to a coach. 
was well, the final jump of the contest, Steve. She's already confirmed as winner with some very impressive jumps in what's been a pretty solid series. Joint third fastest ever. All right, Benjamin from the USA. 47.02 last year, it's as quick as Ed Moses. Angelica Bengtsson, third and final attempt at 4.66 for her. Oh yes, goes clear, goes clear to Bengtsson. And that from the young Swede is very, very significant indeed. But the surprise of the competition was this man. All the plaudits go to the 22-year-old Paul Conrad Bukovetsky. Coached by his father, former decathlete, he came alive in the fifth round, a huge effort. He has thrown 22 meters indoors. This came oh so close. 21 meters and 97 centimeters. One meter 91 tall, 140 kilograms he weighs. That's two, well, maybe one and a half Tim Hutchings. But he is a huge talent. Mahambo, 690, great performance for the lead. Look at this sort of controlled, slightly staccato run up. Oh, and that's a huge effort. Now the arms go in the air. Now, Mahambo only had one jumper over seven meters in the 2018 season. That was Lorraine Ugin of Great Britain. And there you can see the mark there, very, very close. Mahambo, the dominant force here tonight. Right on the board, absolutely perfect. Seven meters and seven. Will lead a personal best as well. No wonder she's pleased. Some great moments, some great athletes. And let's talk to one of the athletes who enjoyed such a good moment in 2019. Last year, Malika Mahambo went on to win her very first Diamond League trophy, as well as the world title. It all started with Rome, where she won her first ever Diamond League meeting and cracked seven metres for the first time. Let's talk to her now. Okay, so Malika, I want to ask about your first appearance in Rome, which, according to your World Athletics profile, was back in 2015, where you finished fourth in, it, with a 6.79 jump. What, what are your memories of that performance and, and that competition? Uh, I was quite uh, happy about this competition because I think it was my... Um second or maybe third diamond league but it was by far the best place i got so fourth place was quite good and i think it was early in the season so um this was at that time a pretty good result in the end and you obviously at the time as you've acknowledged you were fairly new to the diamond league level of competition what do you think that that higher level of competitor did for your performance level I think it's really important to um, compete at these high level competitions because um, yeah, that's the best training you can get for world championships. For example, you have the best people there, they are giving their best and yeah, it's a tough competition. And if you compare to national um, competitions, the uh, quality is not that good. And even with other international um, competitions, yeah, I mean, Diamond League by is the best, uh, yeah, the best competition series worldwide. So, yeah, there's no way, way around it. Let's talk about Rome last year then, because it was such a big, big performance from you. I think, was it your first time over seven metres? Yeah, it was. Did, did you think you were in that, such, that sort of form coming into that meeting? Um, yes, I mean... Uh, I was in a good shape, so it was uh, it was possible to do it. Um, but still, then doing it is still something that you really have to to work on because it's not done by just being in a good physical shape. So it's much about mental um, preparation and mental competition. 
and that competition was uh yeah it was demanding i mean it was not bad but i was uh, still trying to yeah to give my best and it was not <laughs> done before the seven or seven jump so um yeah that was something special after the jump did you realize you'd gone over seven meters and when the mark was confirmed what what was your reaction what can you remember <laughs> um yeah it was uh i don't know i'm not so good i think at estimating the length of an attempt <laughs> by looking at the sand pit. Um, so I was rather looking at the um, table where it was written. And then when it um, appeared, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I really did it. And finally it's there. And I was super happy. Um, it was a great feeling. Um, I was there with my co-coach, so not my main coach. So it was also something uh, we had to get used to, you know, being in such a competition, working together um, at such a high level, but it was working quite well. Um, so I was really happy to be there um, in Rome, <laughs> celebrating my first seven meter jump. And um, yeah, that was something really, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it's for every long jumper, um, the first seven meter jump is something special. But then after it was more like feeling the pressure. Okay, I did it once, but will this be something that's just going to happen once in my lifetime or will I yeah, <laughs> proceed on that and improve? So it was also um, after it, but not at the day of the competition, but after it, some kind of um, something that makes you also nervous because now you're like, okay, I want to do it again and again and again. Yeah. But I don't know yeah. if I will. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you did. You did it many times. Yeah, I did. <laughs> what, what, what did your lead coach say to you after the meet then? Presumably you spoke to him on the phone. Um, yeah, he was, uh, he was certain about my physical shape and he was like, okay. Uh, he didn't tell me that before, but he was like, yeah, I'm pretty sh I was not surprised that you jumped seven meters that day. Yeah, so he was confident. <laughs> Second on that day in Rome was Katerina Barguen. I mean, she's such a fierce competitor, although she's better known in the triple jump. She's obviously a fantastic long jumper. What is it like competing with someone like that who you know is really good, but maybe you don't know what level they might produce on the day? Um, yeah, that's something special because I also think, especially with her, um, she's a um, yeah, special kind of personality is, uh, Yeah, when it comes to competition because she has a, she's a unique competitor, I would say. She's always making... Uh, screaming and shouting at the at the audience, um, trying to um, get some more applause. And yeah, she's really pushing herself with each attempt. And that is something that's really, uh, yeah, she's rocking the show. So it's uh, every time um, really interesting to be in a competition with her. And from Rome, you remained unbeaten all season. How hard was it to maintain those standards? You say that there was a bit of pressure on yourself, a bit of, you know, to, to repeat these seven meet performances, but you managed to do it almost effortless, effortlessly. But it must have been difficult because it was such a long season. Um, yeah, it was, like you said, not that hard in the end because my physical shape was really good and I worked much on my mental mindset too. So, um, yeah, I, I could manage it, even though the season was long. But, um, yeah, I don't know. At some point, you just do it, and then you yeah, to, you start to think less about how often you jump seven meters, or if or if not, then the pressure is gone, and then you just jump and enjoy the competition. So that's what I learned uh, during my 2019 uh, season, I guess. What, what do you think was behind your progression in 2019? Because I saw on your results, you were doing indoor races, you were competing over 100 metres at the National Championships last year, for instance. But then I'm also aware that you're quite into yoga, you're quite enthusiastic about taking time away from the sport, travelling. Do you think that everything just combined for you last year? Uh, yeah, definitely. I couldn't say it was just one thing because I worked on so many uh, levels and things so I think that's my 2019 season is the result of working 
on all of these. Um, yeah, for sure, the, um, the speed uh, work we did was really important for me. Um, but I mean, we were always doing speed work. It was just not, I was not able to prove it or show it uh, during competition because um, it was sometimes or often difficult to plan long jump and 100 meter at the same time. So the first thing you drop is 100 meter. Um, yeah, but also it's, yeah, meditation that I'm really fond of. I meditate every day and uh, I, I work on that and then for sure just developing my myself my personality growing as a person um doing my travels this is also making me uh yeah i guess more uh yeah it widens the horizon and makes you makes you able to give more because you have seen more because you have experienced more is, is meditation something fairly new for you or do you think it's just begun to give you results? Um, yeah, I started with daily meditation in 2018. So, um, yeah, I think, but it's with every year you, you just, yeah, develop more and I work more on, uh, yeah, on myself and my mindset for competition and also for me as a person, how I look uh, on myself, what I feel what is sport meaning to me. I was just in the last years um, trying to get many answers and find much. So I think that's where I can rely on now. Massive thanks to Malaika for joining us. And if her 2019 is anything to be going by, we should all be taking up meditation. Thanks too to Donathan Brazier and Helena Beery for joining us. And thank you for watching this very special episode of the Wanda Diamond League Corum. I hope you can join us next time when we'll be going through some of the best bits from Rabat. Goodbye and stay safe.